William Faulkner was born in 1897 in New Albany, Mississippi and grew up in Oxford Lafayette country which in his fiction became Jefferson City. He started out to become a poet but soon turned to fiction and discovered in the disturbed southern society he depicted a reflection of the problems of the modern world. He captures in his novels and short stories like That Evening Sun, The Anguish of the Human Spirit caught in a world of conflicting values. During World War I, Faulkner served in the Canadian Air Force and before publishing his first novel in 1926, took a trip to France and later worked for a New Orleans newspaper. The Sound and the Fury, his fourth novel, brought him critical acclaim and two years later in 1931, national prominence. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1950. Beginning with this beautiful story, That Evening Sun by William Faulkner. Monday is no different from any other weekday in Jefferson now. The streets are paved now and the telephone and electric companies are cutting down more and more of the shade trees, the water oaks, the maples and locusts and elms to make room for iron poles bearing clusters of bloated and ghostly and bloodless grapes. And we have a city laundry which makes the rounds on Monday morning, gathering the bundles of clothes into bright colored, specially made motor cars. The soiled wearing of a whole week now flees apparition like behind alert and irritable electric horns with a long diminishing noise of rubber and asphalt like tearing silk and even the negro women who still take in white people's washing after the old custom fetch and deliver it in automobiles. But 15 years ago on Monday morning the quiet dusty shady streets would be full of negro women with balanced on their steady to band heads bundles of clothes tied up in sheets almost as large as cotton bales carried so without touch of hand between the kitchen door of the white house and the blackened wash pot beside the cabin door in negro hollow nancy would set her bundle on the top of her head then upon the bundle in turn she would set the black straw sailor hat which she wore winter and summer she was tall with a high sad face sunken a little where her teeth were missing sometimes we would go a part of the way down the lane and across the pasture with her to watch the balanced bundle and the hat that never bobbed nor wavered even when she walked down into the ditch and up the other side and stooped through the fence. She would go down on her hands and knees and crawl through the gap, her head rigid, up tilted, the bundle steady as a rock or a balloon and rise to her feet again and go on. Sometimes the husbands of the washing women would fetch and deliver the clothes, but Jesus never did that for Nancy. Even before father told him to stay away from our house, even when Dilsey was sick and Nancy would come to cook for us. And then about half the time we did have to go down the lane to Nancy's cabin and tell her to come on and cook breakfast. We would stop at the ditch because father told us to not have anything to do with Jesus. He was a short black man with a razor scar down his face and we would throw rocks at Nancy's house until she came to the door leaning her head around it without any clothes on. What you all mean chunking my house? Nancy said. What you little devils mean? Father says for you to come and get breakfast. Caddy said. Father says it's over a half an hour now and you've got to come to you've got to come this minute. I ain't studying no breakfast, Nancy said. I'm going to get my sleep out. I bet you are drunk, Jason said. Father says you're drunk. Are you drunk, Nancy? Who says I is? Nancy said. I got to get my sleep out. I ain't studying no breakfast. 
So after a while we quit chunking the cabin and went back home. When she finally came, it was too late for me to go to school. So we thought it was whiskey until that day. They arrested her again and they were taking her to jail and they passed Mr. Stowell. He was the cashier in the bank and deacon in the Baptist church and Nancy began to say, when you going to pay me white man? When you going to pay me white man? It's been three times now since you paid me a cent. Mr. Stowell knocked her down, but she kept on saying, when you going to pay me white man? It's been three times now since. Until Mr. Stowell kicked her in the mouth with his heel and Marshall caught Mr. Stowell back and Nancy lying in the street laughing. She turned her head and spat out some blood and teeth and said, it's been three times now since he paid me a cent. That was how she lost her teeth. And all that day they told about Nancy and Mr. Stowell and all that night the ones that passed the jail could hear Nancy singing and yelling. They could see her hands holding to the window bars and a lot of them stopped up until almost daylight when the jailer began to hear a bumping and scrapping upstairs and he went up there and found Nancy hanging from the window bar. He said that it was cocaine and not whiskey because no nigger would try to commit suicide unless he was full of cocaine because a nigger full of cocaine was not a nigger any longer. The jailer cut her down and revived her. Then he beat her, whipped her. She had hung herself with her dress. She had fixed it all night. But when they arrested her, she didn't have on anything except a dress and so she did not have anything to tie her hands with and she could not make her hands let go of the window ledge. So the jailer heard the noise and ran up there and found Nancy hanging from the window, stark naked, her belly already swelling out a little, like a little balloon. When Dilse was sick in our cabin and Nancy was cooking for us, we could see her apron swelling out. That was before Father told Jesus to stay away from the house. Jesus was in the kitchen sitting behind the stove with his razor scar on his black face like a piece of dirty string. He said it was a watermelon that Nancy had under her dress. It never come off, off your wine though. Nancy said. Off of what wine? Caddy said. I can cut down the wine. It did come off off. Jesus said. What makes you want to talk like that before these children? Nancy said. Why aren't you go on to work? You done yet. You want Mr. Jason to catch her hanging around his kitchen talking that way before these children. Talking what way? Caddy said. What wine? I can't hang round white man's kitchen, Jesus said. But white man can hang around mine. White man can come in my house, but I can't stop him. When white man want to come in my house, I ain't go no house. I can't stop him, but he can kick me out on it. He can't do that. Dilse was still sick in a cabin. Father told Jesus to stay off our place. Dilse was still sick. It was a long time. We were in the library after supper. Isn't Nancy through in the kitchen yet? Mother said. It seems to me that she has had plenty of time to have finished the dishes. Let Quentin go and see, Father said. Go and see if Nancy is through, Quentin. Tell her she can go on home. I went to the kitchen. Nancy was through. The dishes were put away and the fire was out. Nancy was sitting in a chair close to the coal stove. She looked at me. Mother wants to know if you're through, I said. Yes, Nancy said. She looked at me. I done finished. She looked at me. What is it? I said. What is it? 
I'm nothing but a nigger. Nancy said. It ain't none of my fault. She looked at me, sitting in the chair before the coal stove, the sailor hat on her head. I went back to the library. It was the coal stove and all. When you think of a kitchen being warm and busy and cheerful, and with the coal stove and dishes all put away, and nobody wanting to eat at that hour. Is that true? Mother said. Yes, sum. I said. What is she doing? Mother said. She's not doing anything. She's through. I'll go and see. Father said. Maybe she's waiting for Jesus to come and take her home. Caddy said. Jesus is gone. I said. Nancy told us how one morning she woke up and Jesus was gone. He quit me, Nancy said. Done gone to Memphis, I reckon. Dodging them city police for a while, I reckon. And a good riddance, father said. I hope he stays there. Nancy scared of the dark, Jason said. So are you? Caddy said, I am not, Jason said, scary cat, Caddy said, I am not, Jason said, you Candons, mother said, father come back, I am going to walk down the lane with Nancy, he said, she says that Jesus is back, has she seen him, mother said, no, some negro sent a word that he was back in town. I won't be long. You will leave me alone to take Nancy home? Mother said. Is her safety more precious to you than mine? I won't be long, father said. You will leave these children unprotected with that negro about. I am going to, Caddy said. Let me go, father. What would he do with them? If he were unfortunate enough to have them, father said. I want to go too, Jason said. Jason, mother said. She was speaking to father. You could tell that by the way she said the name. Like she believed that all day father had been trying to think of doing the thing she would not like the most. And that she knew all the time that after a while he would think of it. I stayed quiet because father and I both knew that mother would want him to make me stay with her if she just thought of it in time. So father did not look at me. I was the oldest. I was nine and Caddy was seven and Jason was five. Nonsense, father said. We won't be long. Nancy had her hat on. We came to the lane. Jesus always been good to me, Nancy said. Whenever he had two dollars, one of them was mine. We walked in the lane. If I can just get through the lane, Nancy said, I'll be all right then. The lane was always dark. There is where Jason gets scared on Halloween, Caddy said. I did not. Jason said. Can Aunt Rachel do anything with him? Father said. Aunt Rachel was old. She lived in a cabin beyond Nancy's by herself. She had white hair and she smoked a pipe in the door all day long. She did not work anymore. They said she was Jesus' mother. Sometimes she said she was and sometimes she was not any kin to Jesus. Yes, you did, Caddy said. You were scarier than Franny, you were scarier than TP, even scarier than niggers. Can nobody do nothing with him? Nancy said. He say I done woke up the devil in him and ain't but one thing going to lay it down again. Well, He's gone now, father said. There's nothing for you to be afraid of now and if you just let white men alone. Let what white men alone? 
Caddy said. How let them alone? He ain't gone nowhere, Nancy said. I can feel him, I can feel him now in this lane. He hearing his talk, every word hits somewhere, waiting. I ain't see him and I ain't going to see him again. But once more, with that razor in his mouth, that razor on the string down his back, inside his shirt, and then I ain't going to be even surprised. I was not scared, Jason said. If you did behave yourself, you did have kept out of this, father said. But it's all right now. It's probably in St. Louis. He probably got another wife by now and forgot all about you. If he has, I better not find out about it, Nancy said. I did stand there right over them and every time he robbed her, I did cut that arm off. I did cut his head off and I did slit her belly and I did shove. Hush, father said. Slit whose belly, Nancy? Caddy said. I was not scared, Jason said. I did walk right down this lane by myself. Yeah, Caddy said. You would not dare to put your foot down in it if we were not here too. Dilse was still sick, so we took Nancy home every night until mother said. How much longer is this going on? I to be left alone in this big house while you take home a frightened negro? We fixed a pallet in the kitchen for Nancy. One night we waked up hearing the sound. It was not singing and it was not crying, coming up the dark stairs. There was a light in mother's room and we heard father going down the hall, down the back stairs and Caddy and I went into the hall. The floor was cold, our toes curled away from it while we listened to the sound. It was like singing and it was not like singing like the sounds that Negroes make. Then it stopped and we heard father going down the back stairs and we went to the head of the stairs. Then the sound began again in the stairway, not loud. And we could see Nancy's eyes halfway up the stairs against the wall. They looked like cat's eyes too, like a big cat against the wall watching us. When we came down the steps to where she was, she quit making the sound again. And we stood there until father came back up from the kitchen with his pistol in his hand. He went back down with Nancy and they came back with Nancy's pallet. We spread the pallet in our room. After the light in mother's room went off, we could see Nancy's eyes again. Nancy, Caddy whispered, are you asleep? Nancy? Nancy whispered something. It was oh or no. I don't know which. Like nobody had made it. Like it came from nowhere and went nowhere until it was like Nancy was not there at all. That I had looked so hard at her eyes on the stairs that they had got printed on my eyeballs like the sun does when you have closed your eyes and there is no sun. Jesus. Nancy whispered, Jesus. Was it Jesus? Caddy said. Did he try to come into the kitchen? Jesus, Nancy said, like this, Jesus, until the sound went out like a match or a candle does. It's the other Jesus, she means, I said. Can you see us, Nancy? Caddy whispered. Can you see your eyes too? I am nothing but a nigger, Nancy said. God knows, God knows. What did you see down there in the kitchen? Caddy whispered. What tried to get in? God knows, Nancy said. We could see her eyes. God knows. Dulce got well, she cooked dinner. You did better stay in bed a day or two longer, father said. What for? Dulce said. If I had been a day later, this place would be to rack and ruin. Get on out of here now and let me get my kitchen straight again. Dilsey cooked supper too and that night, just before dark, Nancy came into the kitchen. How do you know he's back? Dilsey said. You ain't seen him. Jesus is a nigger, Jason said. I can feel him. Nancy said, 
I can feel him laying yonder in the ditch. Tonight? Dilse said. Is he there tonight? Dilse is an eager too. Jason said. You try to eat something. Dilse said. I don't want nothing. Nancy said. I ain't a nigger. Jason said. Drink some coffee. Dilse said. She poured a cup of coffee for Nancy. Do you know he's out there tonight? How come you know it's tonight? I know, Nancy said. He's there waiting. I know. I done lived with him too long. I know. What is he fixing to do for? He know it himself. Drink some coffee, Dilse said. Nancy held the cup to her mouth and blew into the cup. Her mouth burst out like a spreading adders, like a rubber mouth, like she had blown all the color out of her lips with blowing the coffee. I ain't a nigger, Jason said. Are you a nigger, Nancy? A hell-born child, Nancy said. I won't be nothing soon. I going back where I come from soon. She began to drink the coffee. While she was drinking, holding the cup in both hands, she began to make the sound again. She made the sound into the cup and the coffee sploshed out onto her hands and her dress. Her eyes looked at us and she sat there, her elbows on her knees, holding the cup in both hands, looking at us across the wet cup, making the sound. Look at Nancy, Jason said. Nancy can cook for us now. Dilse has got well now. You hush up, Dilse said. Nancy held the cup in both hands, looking at us, making the sound like there were two of them, one looking at us and the other making the sound. Why not you let Mr. Jason telephone the marshal, Dilse said. Nancy stopped then, holding the cup in her long brown hands. She tried to drink some coffee again, but it sploshed out of the cup onto her hands and her dress and she put the cup down. Jason watched her. I can't swallow it, Nancy said. I swallows, but it won't go down me. You go down to the cabin, Dilse said. Fronny will fix your pallet and I will be there soon. Won't no nigger stop him, Nancy said. I ain't a nigger, Jason said. Am I Dilse? I reckon not, Dilse said. She looked at Nancy. I don't reckon so. What you going to do then? Nancy looked at us. Her eyes went first, like she was afraid there was no time to look without hardly moving at all. She looked at us, at all three of us, at one time. You remember that night I stayed in your old room? She said. She told about how we waked up early the next morning and played. We had to play quiet on a pallet until father woke up and it was time to get breakfast. Go and ask your mom to let me stay here tonight. Nancy said, I won't need no pallet. We can go play some more. Caddy asked mother, Jason went too. I can't have Negro sleeping in my bedrooms, mother said. Jason cried. He cried until mother said he could not have any dessert for three days if he did not stop. Then Jason said he would stop if Dilse would make a chocolate cake. Father was there. Why don't you do something about it? Mother said. What do we have officers for? Why is Nancy afraid of Jesus? Caddy said. Are you afraid of father, mother? What would what could the officers do? Father said. If Nancy has not seen him, how could the officers find him? Then why is she afraid? Mother said. She says he is here. She says she knows he is there tonight. Yet we pay taxes, Mother said. I must wait here alone in this big house while you take a Negro woman home. 
You know that I am not lying outside with her razor, father said. I'll stop if Dilse will make a chocolate cake, Jason said. Mother told us to go out and father said he didn't know if Jason would get a chocolate cake or not, but he knew what Jason was going to get in about a minute. We went back to the kitchen and told Nancy. Father said for you to go home and lock the door and you will be all right, Caddy said. All right from what, Nancy? Is Jesus mad at you? Nancy was holding the cup in her hands again, her elbows on her knees and her hands holding the cup between her knees. She was looking into the cup. What have you done that made Jesus mad? Caddy said. Nancy let the cup go. It didn't break on the floor, but the coffee spilled out. And Nancy st sat there with her hands still making the shape of the cup. She began to make the sound again, not loud, not singing and not unsinging. We watched her. Here, Dilse said, you quit that now. You get all of yourself. You wait here. I'm going to get Wash to walk home with you. Dilse went out. We looked at Nancy. Her shoulders kept shaking, but she quit making the sound. We watched her. What's Jesus going to do to you? Caddy said. He went away. Nancy looked at us. We had fun that night. I stayed in your all's room, didn't we? I didn't, Jason said. I didn't have any fun. You were asleep. You were asleep in mother's room, Caddy said. You were not there. Let's go down to my house and have some fun, Nancy said. Mother won't let us. I said, it's too late now. Don't bother her, Nancy said. We can tell her in the morning. She won't mind. She will not let us, I said. Don't ask her now, Nancy said. Don't bother her now. She did not say we couldn't go, Caddy said. We didn't ask, I said. If you go, I'll tell, Jason said. We'll all have fun. Nancy said, they won't mind, just to my house. I've been working for you all a long time. They won't mind. I'm afraid to go, Caddy said. Jason is the one that's afraid. He'll tell. I'm not, Jason said. Yes, you are, Caddy said. You will tell. I won't tell, Jason said. I'm not afraid. Jason ain't afraid to go with me, Nancy said. Is you Jason? Jason is going to tell, Caddy said. The lane was dark. We passed the pasture gate. I bet if something was to jump out from behind that gate, Jason would holler. I would not, Jason said. We walked down the lane. Nancy was talking loud. What are you talking so loud for, Nancy? Caddy said. Who? Me? Nancy said. Listen at Quentin and Caddy and Jason saying I'm talking loud. You talk like there was five of us here, Caddy said. You talk like father was here too. Who? Me? Talking loud? Mr. Jason? Nancy said. Nancy called Jason Mr. Caddy said. Listen how Caddy and Quentin and Jason talk, Nancy said. We are not talking loud, Caddy said. You're the one that's talking like father. Hush, Nancy said. Hush, Mr. Jason. Nancy called Jason Mr. again. Hush, Nancy said. She was talking loud when we crossed the ditch and stooped to the fence where she used to stoop through with the clothes on her head. Then we came to her house. We were going fast then. She opened the door. The smell of the house was like the lamp and the smell of Nancy was like the wick, like they were waiting for one another to begin to smell. She lit the lamp and closed the door and put the bar up. Then she quit talking loud, looking at us. What are we going to do? Caddy said. What do you all want to do? Nancy said. You said? We would have some fun, Caddy said. There was nothing about Nancy's house, 
Nancy's house, something you could smell besides Nancy and the house. Jason smelled it even. I don't want to stay here, he said. I want to go home. Go home then? Caddy said. I don't want to go by myself, Jason said. We're going to have some fun, Nancy said. How? Caddy said. Nancy stood by the door. She was looking at us only. It was like she had emptied her eyes, like she had quit using them. What do you want to do? She said. Tell us a story, Caddy said. Can you tell a story? Yes, Nancy said. Tell it, Caddy said. We looked at Nancy. You don't know any stories. Yes, Nancy said. Yes, I do. She came and sat in a chair before the hearth. There was a little fire there. Nancy built it up when it was already hot inside. She built a good blaze. She told a story. She talked like her eyes looked, like her eyes watching us, and her voice talking to us did not belong to her, like she was living somewhere else, waiting somewhere else. She was outside the cabin. Her voice was inside and the shape of her, the Nancy that could stoop under a barbed wire fence with a bundle of clothes balanced on her head as though without weight like a balloon was there. But that was all. And so this here queen come walking up to the ditch where that bad man was hiding. She was walking up to the ditch and she said, if I can just get past this ditch was what she said. What ditch? Caddy said. A ditch like that one out there. Why did a queen want to go into a ditch? To get to her house, Nancy said. She looked at us. She had to cross the ditch to get into her house quick and bar the door. Why did she want to go home and bar the door? Caddy said. Nancy looked at us. She quit talking, she looked at us. Jason's legs stuck straight out of his pants where he sat on Nancy's lap. I don't think that's a good story, he said. I want to go home. Maybe we had better, Caddy said. She got up from the floor. I bet they are looking for us right now. She went toward the door. No, Nancy said, don't open it. She got up quick and passed Caddy. She did not touch the door, the wooden bar. Why not? Caddy said. Come back to the lamp, Nancy said. We'll have fun. You don't have to go. We ought to go, Caddy said, unless we have a lot of fun. She and Nancy came back to the fire, the lamp. I want to go home, Jason said. I'm going to tell. I know another story, Nancy said. She stood close to the lamp. She looked at Caddy like when your eyes look up at a stick balance on your nose. She had to look down to see Caddy, but her eyes looked like that, like when you are balancing a stick. I won't listen to it, Jason said. I'll bang on the door. It's a good one, Nancy said. It's better than the other one. What's it about? Caddy said. Nancy was standing by the lamp. Her hand was on the lamp against the light, long and brown. Your hand is on that hot globe, Caddy said. Don't it feel hot to your hand? Nancy looked at her hand on the lamp chimney. She took her hand away, slow. She stood there looking at Caddy, wringing her long hand as though it would tie to her wrist with a string. Let's do something else, Caddy said. I want to go home, Jason said. I got some popcorn, Nancy said. She looked at Caddy and then at Jason and then at me and then at Caddy again. I got some popcorn. I don't like popcorn, Jason said. I'd rather have candy. Nancy looked at Jason. You can hold the paper. You can hold the popper. She was still wringing her hand. It was long and limp and brown. All right, 
Jason said, I'll stay a while if you can do that. Caddy can't hold it. I will want to go home again if Caddy holds the popper. Nancy built up the fire, looked at Nancy putting her hands in the fire. Caddy said, What's the matter with you, Nancy? I got popcorn, Nancy said. I got some. She took the popper from under the bed. It was broken. Jason began to cry. Now we can't have any popcorn, he said. We ought to go home anyway, Caddy said. Come on, Quentin. Wait, Nancy said. Wait, I can fix it. Don't you want to help me fix it? I don't think I want any. Father came in. He looked at us. Nancy did not get up. Tell him, she said. Caddy made us come down here, Jason said. I didn't want to. Father came to the fire. Nancy looked up at him. Can't you go to Aunt Rachel's and stay? He said. Nancy looked up at father, her hands between her knees. He's not here, father said. I would have seen him. There's not a soul in sight. He in the ditch, Nancy said. He waiting in the ditch yonder. Nonsense, father said. He looked at Nancy. Do you know he's there? I got the sign, Nancy said. What sign? I got it. It was on the table when I come in. It was a hog bone with blood meat still on it. Laying by the lamp, he's out there. When you all walk out that door, I gone. Gone where, Nancy? Caddy said. I am not a tattletale, Jason said. Nonsense, father said. He out there, Nancy said. He looking through that window this minute, waiting for you all to go, then I gone. Nonsense, father said. Lock up your house and we'll take you on to Aunt Rachel's. It won't do any good, Nancy said. She didn't look at father now, but he looked down at her, at her long, limp, moving hands. Putting it off won't do no good. I don't know, Nancy said. I can't do nothing, just put it off. And then don't do no good, I reckon it belong to me. I reckon what I going to get ain't no more than mine. Get what? Caddy said. What's yours? Nothing, father said. You all must get to bed. Caddy made me come, Jason said. Go on to Aunt Rachel's, father said. It won't do no good, Nancy said. She sat before the fire, her elbows on her knees, her long hands between her knees. When even your own kitchen won't do no good. When even if I was sleeping on the floor in the room with your children, and the next morning there I am and blood. Hush, father said. Lock the door and put out the lamp and go to bed. I scared of the dark, Nancy scared, said. I scared for it to happen in the dark. You mean you're going to sit right here with the lamp lighted, father said. Then Nancy began to make the sound again, sitting before the fire, her long hands between her knees, her damn father said. Come along, children, it's past bedtime. When you all go home, I gone, Nancy said. She talked quieter now, and her face looked quiet, like her hands. Anyway, I got my coffin money saved up with Mr. Lovelady. Mr. Lovelady was a short, dirty man who collected the Negro insurance coming around to the cabins or the kitchens every Saturday morning to collect 15 cents. He and his wife lived at the hotel. One morning, his wife committed suicide. They had a child, a little girl. He and the child went away. After a week or two, he came back alone. We would see him going along the lanes and the back streets on Saturday mornings. Nonsense, father said. You will be the first thing I will see in the kitchen tomorrow morning. You will see what you'll see, I reckon, Nancy said but it will take the lot to say what that will be. We left her sitting before the fire. Come and put the bar up, father said, but she didn't move. She didn't look at us again, sitting quietly there between the lamp and the fire. From some distance down the lane, we could look back and see her through the open door. What, father? Caddy said. 
What's going to happen? Nothing, father said. Jason was on father's back, so Jason was the tallest of all of us. We went down in the ditch. I looked at it quiet. I couldn't see much where the moonlight and the shadows tangled. If Jesus is hid here, he can see us, can't he? Caddy said. He's not there, father said. He went away a long time ago. You made me come, Jason said. High against the sky, it looked like father had two heads, a little one and a big one. I didn't want to. We went up, we went up out of the ditch. We could still see Nancy's house and the open door, but we couldn't see Nancy now, sitting before the fire with the door open because she was tired. I just done got tired, she said. I just a nigger. It ain't no fault of mine. But we could hear her because she began just after we came up out of the ditch, the sound that was not singing and not unsinging. Who will do our washing now, father? I said. I am not a nigger, Jason said, high and close above father's head. You are worse, Caddy said. You are a tattletale. If something was to jump out, you would be scarier than a nigger. I wouldn't, Jason said. You did cry, Caddy said. Caddy, father said. I wouldn't, Jason said. Scary cat, Caddy said. Candace, father said. Thank you.